evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to 10 Secret Sites on the California Coast. Oh, uh, with our NOAA team members, Wendy Kodesh, Matt Pickett, and Paul Hobie. Paul will be facilitating the event of the questions, and he will also be introducing oh, uh, the NOAA team members up front. I uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, this is also uh, brought to you by the San Jose FAST team. Uh, we are a core group of 22 FAST team uh, members, OWA representatives. And oh, uh, as we get, get further into this, you will be offered WINGS credit at the completion of this event. We'll discuss a little bit of that as we go further into the event. Here we have the three, oh, the basic master and advanced WINGS credits, and also a little uh, information about WINGS Pro. All right, next slide. The next one we're going to be talking about is uh, the WINGS topic of the quarter. As you know, a proficient pilot is always learning, practicing, staying knowledgeable, and flying. Uh, we figure that doing this quarterly with the Advanced Learning Center, oh, uh, the three or four knowledge credits can be obtained from fasafety.gov. You simply search in the top right-hand corner. Uh, those are offered along with the flight credits. There are four, of course, flight training credits and four knowledge credits. That is more than you need for a phase of the wings, which will be completed within a 12 month period. Uh, if you are an aircraft owner, you will receive insurance uh, or a rebate from your insurance company. And if you fly more than one category of airplane, you, it is well worth your while to change those categories every 12 months. And with that, uh, we will hand you back to Wendy Kodesh. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to the FAA safety team for hosting us this evening. I'm Paul Hobie. I'm the Seabird Protection Network Program Manager, and I'm joined by Commander Matt Pickett and Dr. Wendy Cordish, who are our speakers this evening. Um, I'll be sort of your ATC this evening, uh, offering you uh, guidance at various waypoints. Uh, but before we begin our presentation, I wanted to ask you guys to um, see if you could find the raise your hand button. Um, it should be on the panel on your right. We'll be um, using that at uh, various points throughout the presentation. And um, find the question box. Um, you know, say hi, let us know what your home airport is. Um, we'll uh, be using this to answer your questions throughout the presentation. Um, I can answer them with the keyboard and I'll um, shoot a few over to our presenters at a couple points. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions as well. And uh, we have some quiz questions with real prizes. Um, so um, you, can, you can use that question feature to answer them. Um, so the Seabird Protection Network uh, is based at the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary in San Francisco. And we partner with pilots to help protect seabirds and other wildlife on our coast. Uh, so we um, you know, attend air shows every year. We give presentations to the Air National Guard to the Coast Guard and to pilot clubs like, like yours. Um, and you know we really feel strongly that um, pilots have a key role to play in the conservation of seabirds and wildlife on our coast. Um, so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my background um, or um, more like my, my family's background. Um, so I'm not an aviator, um, but my grandparents were both um, pioneers in early aviation. So my um, grandpa Herm, who you can see on, on the right, uh, on, on the top of that step holding a pipe in his hand, um, started Hobie Airways in Eugene, Oregon in 1930. 
uh, he managed the Eugene Municipal Airport and he was a flight instructor. He gave um, flight instruction in a Travel Air 9000. He delivered uh, mail to rural areas and um, had a, even had a, a short passenger airline that flew in between Eugene, Oregon and Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, my grandmother was one of the first stewardesses on United Airlines. She was the 13th, in fact. She started in 1930. Um, and she flew up and down the West Coast in Ford Tri-Motors and then later um, the DC-3, which you see here. Uh, she worked for United for 10 years as a stewardess. She clocked over 2 million miles um, and at the time was the world's flyingest woman. She was even written up in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, and so she later met my grandfather at that time, um, if you were married, you could not retain your position as a stewardess. Um, and so she and he both retired from, um, from aviation way back in the 1930s. Uh, but I think that more than qualifies me to be your ATC today. Um, and so now I wanna um, hand things over to uh, Wendy Cordish so she can tell us a little bit about herself. Great, thanks Paul, great history. Right, so I'm Wendy. I'm also not a pilot, but I'm a geologist and an oceanographer. And after working with pilots, I eventually had this epiphany. Right? Pilots have the best view of geology. I spent so much time looking at rocks under the microscope and up close, and really the best view is from the air. And I kept asking pilots, you know, can you see the San Andreas from here? Or what does this feature look like from the air? And eventually all my questions turned into a flight. So here you can see the Half Moon Bay Airport, uh, Half Moon Bay Pilots Association very kindly took Paul and I up flying in the air cam, which is very cool, open cockpit. This is my first GA flight and this is what my face looked like when I realized I had to put on a life jacket to get to fly over the water. <laughs> um, so, you know, a little nervous, but once I got up in the air, I saw, you know, the magic why you all are here and what you all see from the air. So that was really the best Best days of work I've ever had. And um, the pictures you'll see to today, a lot of them are from these flights that Paul and I took. So, you know, there we are. Um, but today we have a special guest. Sometimes I'm up here talking by myself. Today we're joined by Matt Pickett and he really spent his career flying the coast. So we're joined by a real life pro, um, Matt Pickett. Thank you, Wendy, for inviting me to be your co-pilot on this virtual flight down the coast. So. After your experience in the air cam, when are you going to get your private pilot's license? <laughs> I did go to ground school, so uh, I really thought about it, but it's not um, not a part-time hobby, let's say. Yes. So I'm Matt Pickett. Uh, I flew for NOAA for 20 years, a variety of different research aircraft. You can see the Cessna Citation, uh, Seawolf, Lake Amphibian there, and the Twin Otter. I have over 5,000 flight hours. I have my ATP. I have a, a type rating in the citation. I have a seaplane rating. And then most recently, I have uh, part 107, a remote pilot certificate or a drone operator certificate. Um, my career in NOAA, I did everything from polar bear research in the Arctic to um, manatee surveys down in Florida to coastal mapping using um, high resolution digital cameras. We even flew a airborne gravimeter, which measured gravity from the air um, to do cutting edge research on the shape of the earth, really. So um, about 10 years ago, I retired from flying for NOAA and started a nonprofit called Oceans Unmanned, where we use unmanned aircraft systems or drones to do environmental research and monitoring the same things we were doing with NOAA we're trying to see if we can augment or supplement some of that with these unmanned aircraft systems. So that's what I do now is run that nonprofit. Also, I've had the pleasure of doing some work with Seabird Protection Network on education and outreach events to kind of talk to the general aviation community about their mission and about respecting wildlife and how to fly responsibly along the coast and, and everywhere in the country. So again, thank you, Wendy, for inviting me along. Yeah, I'm glad you're here and thanks for joining us. Um, so now it's about time. We're gonna start our journey and we'll say goodbye to Paul for now and he'll pop up back up in a second and answer some of our questions. See I you will, soon, Paul. 
Uh, before I go, I want to say um, thanks to everyone for telling us where you're tuning in from. We're seeing a lot of folks from Palo Alto, Reed Hillview Airport, people from all over California, really. Uh, Simi Valley, um, someone flying out of Thermal in the Coachella Valley. But I love that um, we have a pilot from Clearwater, Florida, KPIE, and a pilot uh, flying out of Kissimmee, Florida. And then I saw another um, gentleman tuning in from South Dakota. Um, so it's great to, you know, of course, see all of our uh, Californians here and some uh, non-Californians as well. That's uh, MYF Airport in Montgomery, South Dakota. So um, with that, I will leave you for now. Very cool, thanks. Well, welcome everyone and thanks for tuning in from all over. Um, so you've seen this map here. Today we're gonna fly down you know, the majority of the California coast. I'll share with you 10 secret sites along the way and our pro here, Matt, will share with you his pro tips um, specific for each location. So without further ado, let's jump into our first secret site, the secret sands of Shelter Cove. So here we are and let's take a step back and look at our whole state for a second. It's actually being ripped apart. Can you see it? There's evidence if you know where to look. So here's where the movement is happening. North America, that's a big continent, 25 miles thick, this plate, and this Pacific plate, which is a lot thinner, five miles thick, and they're smashing past each other. And it doesn't happen smoothly. And we know the boundary of this, which is the San Andreas Fault. It's actually a whole system of cracks across the whole state. And today I'll show you a couple of them, but we'll focus on from the beginning and where you can see the San Andreas Fault because it covers the coast a lot in the northern part of the state. And there's some really neat areas where you can see it from the air. So let's zoom in on Cape Mendocino here. You can see that the fault bends. And really this is due to the two plates smashing into each other and it causes the terrain of that whole part of the coast to be really steep. It's how the Lost Coast was formed, right? They didn't want to build Highway 1 there because the terrain was too rugged. But if we zoom into Shelter Cove, the fault also runs right by the airport. So you look here at the satellite photo, I'll put in the San Andreas real quick, it runs right there. It's one of the reasons why there's a nice flat runway there. Right? The rugged coast, why is there this nice flat plateau? Partially it's that it's been pulled off of the um, you know, cliffs by the fault. Uh, another way you can see evidence of the fault movement is the black sand on the beaches. I'll show you a picture. You can see the terrain change, right? And you can also see that the sand is dark. So the unusual, the fault movement has called unusual rocks to come up to the surface here. And when they erode, they erode into black sand on the beach. It's actually magnetite, not the same kind of black sand you get in Hawaii. It's magnetic minerals. Um, they're pretty rare here and there's a great place to see them from the air just north of the airport. So very cool, beautiful view here. Um, but this coast is also known for one other thing and that's fog. But um, that's something Matt as a pro knows how to handle. So he's got a tip for us. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I've only been caught under the marine layer like twice in my career and that was up in Alaska and we were flying a Twin Otter fully IFR capable and so we were able to go offshore and climb due regard to get on top of it. Another time we were kind of stuck and we basically just followed the sea buoy and the marine channel into the airport uh, to, to be able to land that way. But you, you really need to, first of all, I know uh, Shelter Cove is kind of a bucket list item for a lot of um, aviators in California. They want to go fly that. It's a really cool airport. So if you want to get up there, um, make sure you have a good plan. Understand your, your ratings and also your aircraft capabilities. Again, when I was flying in Alaska, we flew a Twin Otter fully IFR capable with a co-pilot, two, a two-person crew. And when I was flying in California, I was flying a single engine seaplane, single pilot. And of course, those scenarios are completely different about the capabilities and what you want to do as far as planning your trips. For the general aviation VFR pilots, understand your ratings and your aircraft's ability. Um, always obtain a full weather brief. That's kind of a given. And another thing that's kind of 
evolved since I flew was um, all the tools that are now available to pilots online. You can see this very cool um, live satellite image, or not live, recorded satellite image uh, from a NOAA satellite that can really give you near real time information about the fog along your route and at your destination. And that's available you know, just by looking at your phone if you go to the NOAA websites. Another interesting development that you can utilize is weather cams uh, up and down the coast. And it doesn't even have to be a dedicated weather cam. You can find um, you know, just regular weather cams at islands and scenic spots and small towns and you know, piers along the coast to get a real time look at the weather before you take off. And those were not really available, except for in Alaska, they were kind of available in some of the mountain passes back when I flew up there. But that's, that's a huge change. And now you have, again, like I said, all this information at your, at your fingertips you should definitely take advantage of. Uh, designate a personal hard deck, whatever that comfort level is, should be at least a thousand feet, which we'll talk about multiple times uh, in today's presentation. But know your, your personal hard deck. If you start getting forced below that, have it out. Usually, most of the time, a 180 degree turn and head back to where you came from uh, is your best bet. But understand what your outs are as you plan your flight and as you move forward and reaching those decision points and, and your personal hard deck. So uh, that's kind of what I have to say about the marine layer. It is a concern in California and something you have to be on top of. Uh, and again, there are a lot of tools to help you kind of take a look at that. So back to you, Wendy. Great. That sounds like good advice. Thanks. Next up, we have our very first quick quiz. So if Paul pops back in here, he's going to be facilitating our quizzes. Um, but we have our first one right off the bat. All right. Seabird Control is back online. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a quiz question for you guys, and we're gonna um, uh, we're gonna make this one uh, maybe a little bit harder. Um, so um, why don't we um, you guys locate your uh, question box? Um, I will um, unveil the question in three. I want, oh, wait, I want to know what the prize is first. Ah, the prize is a surprise. <laughs> uh, but it's a real thing that we will send you in the mail if you win. Um, so get ready for our quiz question, which we're unveiling in three, two, one. There's one common land mammal in this area of the Lost Coast that you might spot on the beach. What is it? And uh, please give us the name of the president that it is also named after. I, I haven't seen That's anyone. Um, I haven't seen anyone weigh in with the right question. These are, there's a lot of marine mammals: sea lions, sea otters, mountain lions, elephant mm -hmm. seals. That's a good cow. guess. The cow. <laughs> and Stephen Watson weighed in with Roosevelt elk. I am nice. correct. The famous Roosevelt beach elk of the Lost Coast. Congratulations, uh, Stephen. Please, um, I'll, I'll correspond with you. And um, thanks to all of you for playing. Um, there, um, there's some. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt was my favorite answer so far, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and camel is also great. Um, so I could keep going. You guys' answers are great. So um, thanks, and I'll um, I'll correspond with our our, our winner, and uh, let you guys carry on. All Thank right, you. thanks, Paul. Fun fact there. I think you could maybe see a whole herd of elk from a plane. I guess you definitely see the black sand in this picture. Um, but so. Get ready, there's quick quiz questions that'll pop up later in our presentation. But for now, let's continue on our tour of the coast to my favorite spot here on the whole tour, Point Reyes. And that's because it's inching north. And I'll show you what I mean. So here's a satellite photo of Point Reyes. Right? There's two plates here. The San Andreas runs right through the middle. You can kind of see where it is before I draw in the red dotted line, right? There's where the plate movement is. But why is there land on the ocean side? Right? There's a continent and a Pacific plate. Why is there land on the wrong side of the fault? And how to get there? Well, Point Reyes 
was ripped off of North America by the Pacific plate and dragged 200 miles north. Pretty amazing. And there's not a lot of places on Earth where you can see it so clearly. But it moved at the rate of your fingernails. It is maybe my most my favorite fun fact. Plates around here, San Andreas moves about you know, centimeters per year, which is a similar rate to your fingernails. And believe it or not, I really think about this when I clip my fingernails. So maybe you will too. Matt, you will too. I know you will. <laughs> um, but so the plate's been moving for a long time. It's here from SoCal. And you can see it really clearly across the fault. On the left-hand side, you, hear in the, you can see here zoomed in, you have a forest, dark green, and on the other side, you have grass. And that's because the chunk that ripped off from Southern California is, has granite basement. It's a different kind of rock than marine sediment on the other side. So the soils that form out of the basement rock are different and they support a different kind of plant community on top of it, which is amazing. And it's really cool. I love how it impacted the vegetation. Um, but you can see this when you fly to Mala's Bay. Right, and I love this picture. I didn't know this until I was researching this talk. Unmistakably straight that bay now that you look at it, right? No coincidence. And also you can see really clearly that there's a color change on both sides. And it's just spectacular. What a cool view. Um, it's not in all the places you can see this, but the fault created this shallow bay. And there's not a lot of places on our coast that have this type of um, habitat. So this is one area where there's eelgrass. And that's the rarest habitat in all of California. So it's a pretty special place with some pretty special wildlife. And Matt's gonna tell us how to fly around this area because it has some special wildlife. Okay, we're talking dots now and we're gonna get a little bit into the weeds right now, so bear with me. But I think this is you know, one of the most interesting points of this presentation as far as kind of unknown uh, what the background and definition of these different blue and magenta dots we'll talk about. Uh, first, we'll talk about the blue dots, uh, which delineate national sanctuaries or national park service or other kind of protected areas. And before you go on, I'm going to jump in on Paul's deal here and offer a giveaway hat for the first person who can name. Well, there's four. California National Marine Sanctuaries, but there's five on the West Coast. So the first person who can name all five West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries, put it in your chat, Paul will figure out the winner and I'll send you uh, Oceans Unmanned hat for the That's credit. That's a tough question. That's a lot of typing. <laughs> I, sh I show my prizes on like air traffic control. <laughs> so the blue dots again are Marine Sanctuaries National Park and what they are delineating is large concentrations of wildlife. And with those blue dots come a recommended altitude to maintain 2,000 feet AGL. And that's to minimize or get rid of wildlife disturbance across a broad range of seabirds and wildlife. And in some areas, they're to um, not disturb human use because uh, these are you know, remote areas that the park service and sanctuaries want people to go out uh, enjoy nature and quiet. And so having that 2,000 foot ceiling uh, allows the human visitors to enjoy nature as well. Um, so along, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the science behind 2,000 feet later on in the presentation. So it's not just, you know, kind of a general number. It's actually based on some research that research have been doing for, for decades, really, in these different places that we'll touch on later. The other dots you'll see here are the magenta dots. And the magenta dots represent higher concentrations of seabirds, um, sensitive nesting areas, high concentrations of seabirds. Um, and those are usually maintained or next to uh, the blue dots, but they are separate because magenta dots are no regulations, no regula regulated overflight zones, and ROZ, you might hear us use that term but those are required to maintain at least a thousand foot AGL. Otherwise you're violating NOAA regulations, not FAA regulations, but, but NOAA regulations. So blue dots recommended 2000, magenta dots required to maintain a thousand feet as per NOAA regulations. And there is an exception for um, emergency. So, you know, in those emergency situations where you're forced to fly through there, um, that is allowed per the NOAA regulations. Did I miss anything on that, Wendy? 
Well, I think that about covers it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I'll just point out there's tons of birds right on one little rock there by the lighthouse. I mean, one I want to hear, hear from Seabird Control if anybody wanted the, the hat. Oh, yeah. Paul, you want to pop Seabird, back in? Meanwhile, Control. I'll pop this picture in. Who's that? Oh, <laughs> that is me circa 1987, 89, oh. something like that, with hair. Oh. And for ice cream, 5,000 feet AGL. And we'll, we'll see that, that times tonight. <laughs> well, all right, Iceman. I've, uh, I've got some news about our winner, uh, Leighton Freitas, who wrote in first with the five West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries, which are uh, Farallons, Monterey, Olympic Coast, Channel Islands, and Cordell Bank. Not necessarily that. in that order, but thanks to everybody that um, wrote in. And uh, we did have a question that I wanted to um, shoot to you guys. Um, what happens if um, the weather does not allow me to fly uh, above a thousand feet AGL in these areas? Uh, great question. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there is an exemption in this regulation for emergencies. However, lack of planning is not necessarily the emergency. So if you plan to fly there and try to stay under the, the ceiling um, just because you want to, um, that's not really an emergency. However, if you get caught flying over that area and you have to transit quickly or turn around to avoid that area, that is an emergency. So um, there is an exemption for emergency, but lack of planning on your part is not an emergency by the definition. So don't just plan on flying there or not look at the marine weather before you, you uh, transit this area. Does that answer it, Paul? I think so. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> and goodbye. See you soon, Paul. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our next secret site. We're at number eight. And this is another fun one. We'll see if I can convince you all that there's the truth behind SFO and it has to do with geology. Okay, so here's, this is a Google Earth image. I didn't have a good photo of this one, but you can see SFO labeled there, right? And you can see the fault. There's some linear lakes there. They're not a coincidence. You can see the fault running and I'll add it in right here. Look at where the fault runs, and then look at where runway 28 at SFO hits the water. They kind of intersect, right? Well, the fault has created a valley between the peninsula and San Bruno Mountain. Right? And so this gap, called the Daily City Gap by commercial pilots, allows wind to pass from the ocean into um, the San Francisco Bay. It creates a great wind to take off straight into. Right, so that's um, you know that's how San Andreas impacts Class Bravo airspace. It's all it's all geology that that uh, explains these things. Um, but you can see it right when you fly um, fly along there. You can see uh, it's you know when you pass there and you look at the runway 28. It's sort of like looking down the barrel of a shotgun. You see these two runways pointing right at you. Well, there's a reason that there's a gap in the topography there, and it's the San Andreas. And also we can San zoom Andreas. in. Yeah, it's San Andreas' most. You love my puns, Matt. <laughs> um, we can also zoom in and see where the fault hits the water. That's another cool thing you can see from the air. Oh, there's a fault in that picture. Here's Muscle Rock, right where the fault hits the water. It's sort of unclear if you don't know where to look, but if you look at that coast, there's a lot of landslides. Right? So there's a lot of slow movement there, and it causes the whole area to be unstable and some erosion. So the rock is falling off there, the cliffs are a little unstable, there's a nice park, but really the fault is that whole zone there. And that's where it leaves the water before um, running north towards Point Reyes. So there we go, truth behind SFO. Uh, Matt, how do we fly this area? Thank you, Wendy. Um, my, my tip here is basically just, you know, SFO can be very, complex airspace and sometimes it's intimidating to GA pilots but if you look at the VFR flyway chart it'll give you clear directions how to fly that and what altitude to, to be clear of the the class Bravo airspace. Um, actually an interesting they just updated the class Bravo airspace in 2019 and the Seabird Protection Network actually was participating in that process to make sure um, that the areas they were concerned about having low overflight still had room in the new class Bravo airspace to, to stay above these critical um, nesting areas along the coast. So 
my, my tip here, just be familiar with this, fly the, fly the route as depicted at the maximum altitude allowed in that, in, in that chart. Plan it in advance again. Just follow the route, um, and you, it takes you some, through some great scenery. Uh, and as Wendy showed you, some very cool geology too. And then you know, have a bad weather options I talked about earlier. You know, if you're flying south and north along the coast and you run into fog, have an idea of uh, what your escape route is. So that's my tips for um, kind of flying and navigating that complex airspace. Great, good advice. All right, if we move down the coast now to Half Moon Bay, we have some secret faults and some secret flocks. So if you see on the photo on the right, there's those linear lakes, the San Andreas Fault. Um, no coincidence there, but Half Moon Bay Airport is not on the San Andreas, right? It's not there. But there's another sort of splinter or fracture off the San Andreas that runs right by the airport. And you can see it in the two photos on the left. If you want to try and see where you think it is before I put it in, I'll show it now. So really the fault cuts right by the airport. It created that bluff there and it helped create the flat area for the runway. Pretty good, pretty good location. Um, all of this faulting has also bent the rock layers offshore and the, the rocks underneath the water there are very cool and you can see them at the surface in one spot. And that's the Fitzgerald tide pool. Do you see that rainbow in the rocks? That is sediment that's turned to hard rock that's been bent. That's a fold there. So why the tide pools there are so cool. There's lots of rocks and lots of layers and things for critters to, to cling onto in the tide pools. So keep an eye out at low tide and you could spot um, these cool sediment folds too. One other impact of the fault is devil slide. That huge rocky cliffy part of the coast is really because of the fault and all this movement and those sediment layers in the rock. It also created a perfect habitat for seabirds, right? And the, there was a colony that lived there that um, was extirpated. The whole colony was, was gone from the rock for a period of time, but it was brought back from the brink by a very intensive effort to restore them using our prop here, our little friend really, using decoys like this one. Oops, where's the camera? This is a common myrrh decoy, and it's one of the real ones that was placed up on Devil Slide Rock, right? Daredevil researchers, you can see in the photo, they had to jump off a boat and scale those rocks to install these. Right? It's an incredible story renowned for its success worldwide, and it's pretty cool. It's right in our backyard, and most people don't know it's there. So if you go to this area, bring your binoculars and check out this rock. But um, I'll put my friend away. One thing we wanted to share about this area is that it's not on your chart. And so I want to point out the visual references here. They are Point San Pedro, that's those triangular striped rocks. And the other reference is Bunker Point, that bunker that looks like it's going to fall off the cliff any day now. Makes me nervous just looking at it. <laughs> that's the region where those birds live. And uh, Matt has a special message about this area too. So I think what's interesting that Wendy didn't mention is a lot of the research I mentioned about a thousand feet and how critical it is and uh, Iceman here talking about five thousand feet. A lot of the data that justifies that thousand feet is collected here at Devil's Slide Rock. The researchers are out there monitoring with binoculars um, and looking for disturbance from low, low flying aircraft. So they collect data every year to kind of look at disturbance and what the altitude, estimated altitude of the aircraft are. So again, a lot of science is happening here and a lot of that science drives um, the thousand foot AGL that those magenta dots uh, delineate. As Wendy said, this is not on your chart. The magenta dots are not um, on this area that is a critical uh, seabird nesting area. Um, so we try to outreach through forums like this, the general aviation community to, to, to understand where Devil Slide Rock is, and even though it's not magenta rock, to, to fly at least a quarter mile away and a thousand feet above that, that very critical nesting area. Oh, so if we haven't convinced you to fly at least a thousand feet uh, for wildlife disturbance and uh, minimizing interactions with birds, 
then you should take your own safety uh, to heart and look at this chart because a thousand feet um, below is, I, I did the math today, it's like 76% of the reported um, bird strike. This is data from the FAA National Wildlife Strike Database that Seabird Protection Network um, correlated and, and analyzed to look at where those different bird strikes happen. And you can see very clearly that even if you don't understand for the bird's sake, why you should be flying at a thousand feet. For your own personal safety, if you're flying above a thousand feet, you get rid of you know 75 percent of the chance of bird strikes. I've never um, experienced a bird strike, which is actually kind of interesting because 75 percent of my flight hours are below a thousand feet, doing surveys for marine mammals er everywhere. So I've been very fortunate in that uh, regard. But again, there is data that shows that flying above a thousand feet. Uh, greatly reduces your, your chance for bird strikes. Good piece of advice. Uh, there I you see. Go. You get. <laughs> That's another reason. All right, you got one more. Oh, um, so this is interesting because um, straight from the far aim, um, it's on, incumbent upon the pilot to try to reduce the risk of bird strikes. And the way they do that is avoid overflight of known areas of bird concentrations. And we've just given you a couple of clues on how to do that. One is magenta dots. Have you mentioned white rocks yet, Wendy? That one's coming. That one's coming. We have another clue yeah. coming up uh, that I won't steal Wendy's thunder. Go but go So it is incumbent upon pilots to reduce the bird strike risk by looking for these areas. And again, magenta dots is a cue um, that there are large concentrations of birds, so you should fly above those or avoid those areas. Great, here, every time you mention it, I'm gonna put it up here. <laughs> I saw you. Paul pop in here a second ago though, because it's time for... Speedbird okay, control. Uh -oh. oh, Paul, I think you're muted. Hello, okay, Hello. here we go. Well, it is time for a quiz question, um, but before we do that, we have a question for you, Wendy Kordish. Um, Where did the land on the west of Tomales Bay originate on its travel to the north? Oh, about 200 miles south. I'm not sure exactly where that is. There's not a perfect, you, what I want to say is there's another triangle, you know, exactly in Southern California and they would match up. That would be amazing. It's not that perfect. And I cherry picked Point Reyes because it's a beautiful place to see this. But um, another example of this inland is Pinnacles. Pinnacles is also dragged, dragged north. So there's a lot of um, neat places like this, but there's not a perfect focal piece on the, on the south side, but about 200 miles. Okay, great. Well, well, thank you. I think uh, I think that's exactly what uh, we were looking for, and um, I will now ask the quiz questions. So, um, get ready with your uh, fingers on the trigger of the question box. Uh, so we will unveil in three, two, one. What are the two visual references surrounding Devil's Slide Rock? A little bit harder one. Point, Point San Pedro and Bunker Point. Vikas Kapoor uh, weighed in with the correct answer. Thanks to all you guys that are writing in. Um, that is Point fast typing. It was pretty. It was pretty fast. He was. He was ready. I didn't um, knew. He knew what we were going to ask. Vikas was ready, and uh, so yeah, it's it's Point San Pedro and Bunker Point, and we have a photo of those um, that. Uh, that Wendy can show. So it's uh, Point San Pedro to the north are these, this amazing outcropping of these striated rocks that are uh, coming out of the ocean. And Wendy taught me that they used to be at the bottom <laughs> of the ocean, uh, which is why they're all lined up in perfect lines. It's the lines of sediment that were crushed together. Gosh, you know well, Paul. <laughs> um, so that is, that is the, um, the northern boundary of the sensitive nesting area. The southern boundary is Bunker Point which is where there is a dilapidated structure um, right along the coast there. Um, they can kind of tell you um, when you're approaching this area. Um, and again, you know, we've talked about flying over a thousand feet. Devil Slide Rock is really where the majority of these 3,000 seabirds are living. Um, so flying offshore of the area uh, and offshore of the rock 
about by about 500 feet or so is also great um, if you can do that. And um, we have uh, maps of this area. We'd love for you guys to sign up for our newsletter um, and, and we can get you that map and I will send that um, link out in the chat box. Um, so uh, thanks again for all of you guys um, for writing in um, and we will see you again shortly. So Paul, uh, Seabird Control, come back. I have a question for you. Uh, sure. so for the four flight users in the crowd, if they reach out to you, you can provide the, the GPS location and coordinates of that so they can input that into their four flight, correct? Yes, that's right. We can have you guys um, create a waypoint for that location because, again, the challenge um, with this location is that um, it's not on your aeronautical charts, right? Um, and so we'd, we'd be happy to uh, provide that waypoint to you um, if you write in. Um, or, or sign up for our newsletter. Yes. That's right. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, Paul. We'll, Thank we'll send that out in our next cool. newsletter. All right. See you soon. All right. Good, good quiz question. Fast typing. <laughs> All right. We are down to number six already, and that is the Forbidden Island of Año Nuevo. This is one place you can truly only see from the air, and I really got a new appreciation for it, um, flying that area. It's, it's pretty spectacular from the air. Um, it's beautiful. But here uh, is the view of Año Nuevo from the air. The San Gregorio Fault, the same one that runs through Half Moon Bay Airport, runs through here. That's really the reason why the island is um, jetting out of the water. It's been lifted out by all this fault movement in the area. If we zoom in on the lighthouse there on the island, it's pretty spectacular. You just can't see this from shore. Uh, the lighthouse was operated at the turn of the century. There was a history of shipwrecks in the region, so that's what the lighthouses are there for. Um, but even then, the lighthouse keeper and his family complained that the seals would get in their house, which is just a hilarious picture to me. Um, but nowadays, it is their house, right? This is off limits, off limits to humans, except for researchers. It's part of a state reserve and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. But it's pretty special because this is a breeding colony for elephant seals. Maybe you've gone on the tour on land there, but they breed here, right? They feed and swim for food across the whole Pacific, but come back to these rocks to breed. If you wanna protect a species, you have to protect the place it reproduces, right? It makes sense. So that's why areas like this on our coast are so important, not just to our region, but really to the to the whole Pacific. Um, and Matt, you have some tips on flying near your wildlife, and you've got some good stories. Yeah, I think you should uh, note that this area is within both magenta and blue dots on the chart, correct? Yes. So, yeah, can you see that? Oops. Um, Won't show it. All right. So, this is a point that it took me a while to kind of understand until I was working closer with, with um, seabird researchers, and that's why does, you know, having birds fly away matter? I mean, my son and my daughter, when they were young, would chase seagulls down the beach and they'd fly away and, and no big deal. And when I started working with seabird researchers, they kind of started to explain that, you know, even one flushing event, if they get disturbed by a drone nowadays or a low flying aircraft and those birds are flushed off of offshore rocks, it exposes the chicks or the eggs to predators. In this picture right here, you see a bald eagle swooping in. Um, I think it's got a chick in its claws. And so even one flushing event, as innocuous as that seems, can, when they flush, the birds can knock their own eggs off into the sea. It opens up to predators. And even one flushing event can impact that colony and that whole breeding season can be, could be gone just by a single flushing event. So that's why we keep on talking about how critical it is. Uh, it's not just birds fly away and they come back. They're actually impacting um, that, that colony pretty uh, severely, potentially. So I think another point, um, you can go to the next slide, is that mm -hmm. island has, oh, there's, <laughs> there's name first. This island has a lot of researchers on it as well. Um, they fly over there and, and take pictures of the elephant seals to do counts. Uh, California sea lions do counts are now starting to do that work with drones, but they're also monitoring for wildlife disturbance again to try to get that data 
to you know talk about a thousand feet and two thousand feet recommended to, to have the scientific justification for that. Here's a picture of I think this actual disturbance of, of a low flying aircraft and the California sea lines um, start to, to flush. And when they flush, um, any of these larger marine mammals, uh, the young can get trampled um, by the bigger adults. And again, you can have fatalities there from a single flushing event, uh, even for, for these longer, for these larger marine animals. One of the things we did in, in my career is we surveyed, like I mentioned, everything from polar bears to blue whales to, to manatees. And, and usually we do a count at higher altitudes at 750 or 1,000 feet. And then we do a low pass to try to get a higher resolution images. And we'd also collect data while we're doing those low passes on the animal's response. And every animal, including the blue whale, which is the largest animal to ever be on planet Earth, would respond negatively to aircraft noise. The Twin Otter's a big plane and we'd come down at 200 feet. And even that blue whale would hear that or sense that and dive to get away. We grizzly bears on the beach in Alaska would, would run from us when we were doing low level surveys with one singular exception. And that's an adult male polar bear. An adult male polar bear, when you're flying 200 feet in a twin otter circling it, will stand up on its hind legs and swat at you, which is just amazing. It has no idea what you are, but it's at the very top of the food chain. And it's like, I don't know what you are, but bring it on. I'm, I'm top of the pyramid down here. So my pro tip is fly above a thousand feet to respect wildlife. However, if you do see a polar bear on the California coast, you have my permission to do a low pass <laughs> because it won't be disturbed. Everything else, please respect and fly at least a thousand, two thousand feet if you're over the, the, the blue dots. So. I can't picture what it would be like to look down and then see this polar bear you know, swatting at you. It, it, it was scary even being in an aircraft at 200 feet away from it. It was still intimidating. That's... 200 feet's not that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's maybe my favorite tip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to have it anytime soon. All right. Moving, moving along, we'll pop down the coast to Monterey. And most people don't know this, but the deepest submarine canyon on the entire west coast is right here in our backyard. Um, it's a canyon as big as the Grand Canyon, um, but it's hidden just below the surface. And this is where there are some truly wild deep sea creatures, right? Right offshore, this is a barrel, barrel head fish. It's got a see-through head, right? And it's unusual to have such deep, deep water so close to shore. So that's why there's so many research institutions around this area including um, the Monterey Bay Research Aquarium Institute. But I'm showing you deep sea stuff. Let's talk about what's on the surface here. You can see that there's a no regulated overflight zone here and that immediately magenta dots tells you birds. So you know there's a lot of wildlife here. But there's also wildlife you can see from your plane like blue whales. They come into the bay to feed off of the nutrient, the animals that, uh, live in the bay because of the nutrient rich water that gets pushed up to the surface from depths here I and mean, that's pretty spectacular and also really really close to shore these days you can see white sharks and that top photo is a pretty recent one if you look who's riding the wave it's not a surfer um, but that bottom photo is yours matt yeah that was just 30 yards offshore that's a juvenile great white shark so you can see them from the air if uh, you know what to look for yeah, I'd rather, I would rather see them from the air than yeah. have one racing towards you in a wave. Um, but, you know, those are just some of the animals you can see in the Monterey Bay from your plane. And one last animal that shows up here every year, like clockwork, is sooty shearwaters. This is a pretty fascinating uh, migration. They come all the way from New Zealand, right, to, for our food. The anchovies that are so famous in Monterey Bay history. City shearwaters still come here to eat that every year. And they just were here last month, in fact. Um, but they inspired a famous horror story. And I love this history. So on a dark night in 1961, birds started slamming into houses, biting people, even uh, downing a power line, which I still don't quite understand. Um, but by the morning, they all lay dead on the streets of Capitola. And the smell reportedly wafted all the way over to Monterey. Um, but does this story sound familiar? 
horror story. This was 1961. In 1963, the movie The Birds was released. And turns out Alfred Hitchcock lived in the area and he saw this Santa Cruz Sentinel article and he was inspired by it in his movie. So it's real. Um, and they come every year, but this particular event hasn't happened since, thankfully. Um, but if you like the story and you want more, you should sign up for our newsletter. We love stories like this, and we send a monthly letter just for pilots with fun stories and interesting things to see when you fly. So Paul will pop that link into the chat or the question box, and you can also just go to cutt.ly backslash seabirds and see for yourself. Um, if we move down to secret site number four, we're now in Big Sur and we go to Bixby Bridge and Matt has the first story here. Uh, this is not a secret, but it was, uh, I, I like this picture. That's the Cessna citation I was flying and we were doing um, some coastal mapping work using lasers to kind of delineate uh, the coastline. Many people might not know that NOAA is in charge of describing and delineating for uh, nautical charts the official coastline of the U.S. And that's actually the coastline on your aeronautical charts as well. If you ever wondered, you know, who makes those coastlines? Is it accurate? NOAA is responsible for flying the coast. Theoretically, every five years, they're supposed to update the shoreline and, and put those onto the charts. And so this was using a laser scanner, airborne laser scanner, to kind of map the coast and test it. We also use that data for other environmental monitoring, erosion, um, and sea level change as well. So we did some work out there a long time ago. Pretty neat. And that's you in the plane, right? Are you flying that? Yes. <laughs> nice. What? Who took the photo? Uh, a guy in a 210. And I was above 1,000 feet. Let it be known, please. <laughs> I was respecting a lot of life. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a nice intro into my next secret site here which is these rocks, right? And you can see Bixby Bridge is in the corner on the right there, but um, this photo is really to point out all those white rocks. And there's a clue there, it's secret until you know what it is, but if you've ever parked your car under a tree, <laughs> you know what birds leave behind. So this secret site is white rocks. Matt mentioned this earlier, white rock, when you hear that, if you see white rock, think seabird flock, because if there's, thousands of seabirds packed onto a tiny rock, you know they're gonna leave their mark. Um, and they actually live in all these offshore rocks here. There's a whole um, colony complex of common MERS that live here. And Paul and I go out every year and visit the researchers and get to look through their fancy spotting scopes. They're really cool. And you get to see the birds up close. And this is me trying to put my phone through the scope and take a picture, but, um, you know, they're beautiful and they're out there. And if you have binoculars, you can see them too. But um, it's a telltale sign, right? White rocks are a telltale sign. They're seabirds. And this is how uh, researchers actually look for new colonies. So it's the best way to see if there's seabirds present and know they're there. And that's kind of a safety message too. You can see white rocks from the air and know that that's a bird dense area. Right, so Wendy, that's another great clue. Along with magenta dots, if you see white rocks, we've given you two clues now as, as for the far aim to avoid concentrations of, of birds. And so those are two along the coast that you can utilize. So, yeah, those are good ones. And speaking of this rocky area. And so again, if, if we haven't convinced you about bird strike issues or disturbance of wildlife, then think about uh, emergency situations where you have to do a ditch, engine loss or some other failure. Um, I used to fly a seaplane along the coast, and so I was always much more comfortable over the water along this coast. And my ditch was always you know, head offshore or close to shore and not even think about uh, trying to land on this rugged coast. And when I was doing research for this presentation, I was actually surprised at the far end talked about um, along coast like this, be a water ditch might be a better bet. And I, and I would agree with that, especially if you look at this picture, I would rather ditch even a non seaplane uh, somewhere close to the coast and not try to um, do it on the sheer cliff face. So a couple points here, make sure you know your best glide speed. 
uh, put it on the dashboard in your cockpit, maybe uh, on a sticky note or, or laminated card. So you can have that in the back of your head. And if everything, anything ever goes wrong, you know exactly what to, to what speed to shoot for. Uh, the other thing is practice dead stick landings uh, in your flight reviews or where you're in the pattern. Uh, have your instructor or have a friend just pull the, pull the throttle at some point in the pattern, practice a dead stick landing so you're familiar uh, and that skill doesn't get rusty. And that bottom right is talks about how to land uh, parallel to the swells is, is the preferred method there. So, and again, thousand feet and above, the, the higher you are, the longer time you have distance and duration to try to figure out where you can ditch safely. And, and so that's another reason to try to, to fly this coast higher. Have you ever water ditched, Matt? Um, not, not by accident, only on, pur on purpose for training uh, with a seaplane, yeah. Wow. Well, Iceman here, Iceman pick here. <laughs> That's five of a thousand feet. So we, one more reason added to our list. Um, but let's move on to secret site number three. We're already to our top three. Uh, we're headed to Morro Bay. And how could I not talk about Morro Rock when we go down to this part of the coast? This is one area where I think people who don't spend all their time thinking and looking at rocks uh, think that doesn't look like the rest of the terrain. You know, how did that get there? Um, well, it turns out Morro Rock is really a volcanic plug. It's composed of volcanic rock. It's covered in guano. So right now it's also a white rock. Um, but it's the base of a volcano. So magma extruded from the ground and it used to look like a real you know, volcano shape, but the rest of it has eroded away and this is just the plug in the center of it. Um, but what's even cooler is that this isn't the only one. So there's actually um, nine sisters here and they form a line between Morro Rock and the San Luis Obispo Airport. And you can really only see that line from the air. You couldn't really get this vantage point um, any other way. And so I think it's really interesting. These are um, volcanic, uh, you know, a chain of volcanoes that formed from an old fault. That's why they're in a, in a really straight line. When you see long straight lines in um, topography in California, a lot of the times there's a fault behind it. So that's what happened here. Volcanic plug um, and a huge line of them right to the airport. So a pretty cool one and definitely one you can only see from the air. So Matt's got a tip for flying this area. Um, so this is near and dear to my heart now. As we move south down the coast, we're kind of coming into more populous areas. Not that you won't see drones or in the other parts of the coast, but obviously near population centers, you need a lot of people, regular general aviation pilots might not realize that the FAA has opened up the airspace under part 107 to 400 feet and below for all drone operators. You can go and get a drone like this for $1,500 and be out flying uh, an hour later up to 400 feet in you know, what has historically been your airspace. But now, um, if we haven't convinced you to fly for your own safety, for ditching, uh, to avoid bird strike and to respect wildlife, please be advised that nowadays 400 feet and below is really the drone zone. Um, you don't need to have a permit to fly up to 400 feet. You can get higher, but there's higher levels of training and permits required. But 400 feet and below, any recreational drone pilot can go out there uh, and fly. With the exception of the no regulated overflight zones, they are prohibited from operating there. They're considered an aircraft. So another reason to, to fly below 1,000 feet is the drone zone down there. Good one. I've I've started to see more drones myself just from walking on the beach. Yeah. Um, but that brings us to number two. We're almost all the way at number one. We have a whale of a channel, uh, the Santa Barbara Channel near the Channel Islands. And this is a place, Matt, you've spent a lot of your career working down there. Um, so take it away and tell us a little bit about your work. Seabird control, how are we doing on time? We have authorization to continue this flight. You do. <laughs> Thank you, Seabird Control. Um, You're good. You're good, guys. The, the first story I'll, I'll tell down there is a, a pretty interesting kind of research project. 
actually I did a flight last month to kind of collect data for this this interesting kind of conflict going on down there. Um, the Santa Barbara Channel is one of the largest um, shipping channels in the world, um, definitely one of the largest in the U.S. I think 40% of all U.S. goods comes through uh, the Santa Barbara Channel into the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. I just got the numbers the other day. It's $270 billion annually worth of goods comes through that, uh, that, that channel. About 30 of these large, large uh, cargo ships transit that area per day. And if you're flying along the coast, you're almost guaranteed if you look uh, south, you'll see one or two of these cargo ships because there's at least one or more going through every hour. But what's interesting is also right north of those islands in the middle or close to the shipping lanes uh, is this upwelling uh, where the, the warm and the cold water meets and there's upwelling which feeds the krill which attracts the blue whales to feed. It's like throwing a bunch of M&Ms on a freeware where the kids want to go out and get them. The blue whales want to go get this, this krill. That's their food source. And of course, you have these traffic lanes of the ships going through. And so a lot of overflights goes to try to um, do in research flights to collect information about where those whales are and congregate when they show up. And then we've actually moved the shipping lanes based on that data to try to minimize that conflict between where the ships are and where the, where the whales are. And they'll start broadcasting alerts when the whales show up every summer. Um, so you'll be able to see that and, and interesting science going on there, down there using aircraft to kind of further that, that, that science. And the one point I really do want to make is again, $270 billion industry that is willing to modify their behavior, both moving the shipping lanes and voluntarily slowing down when the whales are there to protect wildlife. So if we can work with a $270 billion shipping industry to help modify their behavior, we certainly hope that the general aviation community is willing to modify their behavior to avoid low overflights along the California coast to protect um, the, the environment and the wildlife that we all love along this coast. Oh, what a what a great story of partnerships there. Um, and you also are going to tell us a little bit about how to see, right? How do we how do you see these from the uh, okay. air? So there, there's three main whales you'll see when you're when you're flying down that area. The blue, I actually like the earlier picture monitoring better. Uh, and blue whale is is kind of one of the ones that is actually more spectacular from the air than it is on boats. I mean, people go on whale watching boats and you can see humpbacks and get close to them and they're very impressive. But when you see a blue whale from a whale watch boat, you just kind of see a back of the whale, the fin, and it looks kind of gray, and you don't have a sense for how big it is. But when you see it from the air, it glows this electric blue, as you saw in that picture. You can kind of see it here, and you really get a sense of how huge it really is. And so I much rather would see a blue whale from the air than any whale watching boats. You also see the gray whales, which are thin and mottled gray. And I actually looked up a fact today. They're the longest known migration of any mammal they travel round trip 12,000 miles every year between Baja and Alaska uh, and so you'll see them up and down the coast heading north in the spring to go to Alaska and then south in the fall to get to Baja so interesting uh, migration patterns uh, and then the humpbacks which are easy to identify uh, because they have the big white pec fins that look like wings and it's a pretty easy identifying feature. I've also seen uh, killer whales down there. They're, they're relatively rare, um, but the, these are the three main whales. If you see something down there, it's probably one of these three. And when you, because you go out in, in you know, aircraft and you're scanning the water for these, how, how do you spot whales when you're specifically going out to see them? Uh, if, the, if the conditions are nice, you'll actually see a blow uh, and you'll see a white splash if they, when they surface. And so that's your best visual cue is if you see a blow or a disturbance in the water, as long as it's not a lot of white caps. We usually don't go out and survey unless it's, it's pretty flat. So we can pick up those cues as we're looking for them. Nice. I can't imagine seeing blue from the air. It must be really cool. I saw a humpback on, uh, I think Paul and I both saw humpbacks on our geology flights and uh, I was I had to turn off my mic as I was screaming too loud in excitement to see it, it breach and I thought it was, it was really it's you know boats are really cool but there's something else I'm seeing from the air and I can't imagine seeing a blue um, and, and last little tip here and you mentioned this earlier is that 
you know, we can let whales take a take a breather also. Yeah, and I, and I mentioned before that blue whales will will dive when they when they sense a, or hear a little flying aircraft. So they do. It does matter to to these animals as well. Good point. Well, we're at our last quick quiz. Where's ATC Paul? <laughs> hey, Paul. Here I am. I'm ready. Oh, all right. I this is a good one. I hope you guys are ready. Um, we have we have so. First, I wanted to um, just say that there are so many good questions coming in through the chat. Um, we are um, nearing the end of our presentation and we will be sticking around for a few minutes to address some of those questions um, that you guys have been asking. So keep, please keep them coming. Um, and uh, for now, let's get ready for this quiz question that uh, we can throw up there in three, two, one. First correct answer wins a prize. What kind of whale is this? Matt knows. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, Hunter Heller came in hot with gray whale. Oh. Hunter, you've won. And thanks to all of you who have, who have written it. It kind of has a, a mottled gray. Um, and, and that makes it a gray whale. So um, thanks again for all of you guys uh, for writing in. And please keep those questions coming. We'd uh, love to stick around and discuss them with you for a few minutes at the end of our uh, presentation. Great. Nicely done. People really know their whales. Right. Well, let's move on to, you know, we've come counted all the way down. We're here. We're at the number one secret site on our tour. California's Galapagos, the Channel Islands. And Matt, you know, this one is a place you spend a lot of time, a place near and dear to your heart. And um, we'd love to have you take it away. So there, there is a Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary around these islands, and I was a superintendent for a few years um, managing this area. And, and so there's eight islands down there in the Channel Islands, and I don't know why Wendy doesn't tell the story about how they used to be one island and split apart or whatever the cool geology is because there. Because can do it. Look at you. <laughs> so it's you something it. like that. That's right. Um, but, but why they call it the Galapagos is because you have this wide variety of different species because you have the warm water from the south colliding with the colder water from the north. And so you get both warm water species and cold water species. I think they say there's 28 species, species of marine mammals uh, who reside there or pass through. Um, 13 species of seabirds actually breed at the island. So you get this really diverse you know, mix of warm water and cold water species. So it's, it's very diverse. That's the reason there is a national marine sanctuary there and the national park. Um, two of the islands, San Clemente and San Nicolas, are military controlled and they're off limits. Catalina, if you get a chance to fly out there, if you have the equipment, I highly recommend it. It's a very cool spot. The buffalo burgers at the airport are to die for, so make your way up there. The other um, five islands, the four northern ones and Santa Barbara Islands are, are part of the park in the National Marine Sanctuary, and they do have the, the blue dots and the magenta dots within a mile of them. Um, this, this picture here is one of the megapods of common dolphins you can see out there, and I talked earlier about all the whales um, you can see out there. And again, this is one of those spots on the coast where there's a lot of research going on, um, both for uh, living marine resource surveys and disturbance. This is what I mainly did when I flew the Lake Amphibian is we would fly once or twice a week around the entire uh, five island chain, basically doing biological monitoring, counting whales and dolphins, and also counting the ships coming through so we knew where they were and then the different visitor vessel use so we knew you know what the users were doing and how they were interacting uh, with the park and the sanctuary next slide uh, this is actually this past weekend um, we are flying doing visitor and vessel use surveys uh, and that's a picture on the right there of santa barbara island uh, down south so we are out there doing uh, visitor and vessel use surveys, tracking how people utilize um, the, the waters out there. There are some marine protected areas out there, no fishing zones, so we're kind of monitoring uh, those as well. 
there are a couple airports, but they are for park service um, uh, only, though you can get, um, you have recreational access. If you, uh, you wanted to go camping out some of the islands, you can arrange a flight out there, and I highly recommend it um, as a bucket list if you get a chance to go out to these islands. A lot of people who live in Southern California have never been out there, and it, it really is something that everybody should see, even if you don't have the equipment to get out there and fly around above a thousand feet, of course. I highly recommend getting out there either through uh, a, a plane ride or one of the park service boats or concessionaires that service it. It's world-class uh, sea kayaking out there too. It's one of the, the most amazing sea kayaking experience you can have really on, on the planet. So I highly recommend heading out there. Wow, yeah, scuba diving too. The one time I went out yes. there, the diving was you know, out of this yes. world. I also love that these, these photos, we found these photos because last week I was like, Matt, what are you up to this week? Or what, why couldn't you meet yesterday? And you're like, oh, it's just, you know, working. <laughs> then he sent me these photos. Really cool, cool field work. Uh, no, I, I have to admit, I didn't fly the helicopter. I was an observer, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, take to, to the nice view. <laughs> yeah. I'll end here with another one of your beautiful photos from last week, right? Oh, yes, this is. Um, this is San Miguel Island, which is the westernmost point of this chain here. And, and just another look at the chart, you can see the blue dots are six miles around the island, which is, again, recommended 2,000 feet. And the magenta dots are within a mile, which is a no, no regulation to maintain a 1,000-foot AGL around uh, the islands, as Iceman points out there in this pic. Are you saying this picture with the, the, the Miguel was from last week or the one with my hair was from last week? <laughs> you know me. <laughs> Both, that's, maybe? That's more than a week old, that picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good way to end it on those beautiful photos. You know, here we are. We've traveled. Um, we've done all 10 secret sites. Um, and if you want a copy of these, you don't have to take a screenshot here, sign up for our newsletter, and we'll send you a list of our secret sites and our pro tips right away immediately so if you sign up for a newsletter get them right away but let's recap those pro tips and then we have something special at the end so stick around and paul can pop yes. back in here too but uh matt let's See recap those pro tips. Oh, so, so. oh there he is here we are hey paul <laughs> um, um. So I will summarize a few points. First, Wendy, thank you for letting me be your co-pilot on this virtual flight. To, to summarize some of the, the points we made, especially prior to your flight, plan for the marine layer. You know, utilize those cutting edge tools that are now available to you. Have an out, understand your limitations and the aircraft limitations. Know your dots. Again, blue is recommended 2,000. Magenta is uh, required 1,000 foot AGL. Uh, watch for white rocks. Again, those will delineate seabird concentrations of seabirds. So between the magenta dots and the white rocks, you have great visual cues about where you need to avoid um, for uh, large concentrations of birds. And then around SFO or LAX, we didn't get down that far south. Know your BFR flyway. If you just follow that flyway, it makes your flight much more enjoyable than rather than trying to figure it out on the fly. And, and get ATC to guide you through. If you know that flyway, it'll make your experience much more enjoyable. And then while you're airborne, um, some, some reasons kind of summarize all these different reasons to fly at least a thousand feet AGL. We talked about redu reducing bird strike risk to your aircraft, avoid the double slide rock. Again, that's not on the chart, but we can provide that GPS for you for flight users. And now you know the two visual cues to, to understand that area. And again, just general respect for the wildlife. Again, these are science-based recommendations and regulations based on years of experience um, and research to look for these disturbance of these different species. Avoid the drone zone, which might be something new to everybody here. Again, 400 feet and below is now wide open to recreational drone users. And again, the higher you are, the more gliding distance and time you have there in the event there is an emergency. Great, excellent summary. And thanks for all those pro tips, Matt. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, one last fun thing to do with you all in closing, and that's um, to uh, offer this pledge. So Matt shared a lot of good reasons for flying above 1,000 feet AGL. 
popped up that old photo of him for fun every time he mentioned it. But it's a good practice. And we have a pledge that pilots take that says, I fly above 1,000 feet AGL for safety and for wildlife. You probably already fly above 1,000 feet for all the reasons that Matt listed. Um, but you know, right now, uh, you can raise your hand if you commit to flying above 1,000 feet. Right? It's a good practice. You can raise your real hand. You can hit that button if you know. If you can find the hand button, you can raise your hand and commit right now with us um, to fly seabird safe and wildlife safe on the coast. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we actually have an online um, way that you can do this. So if you sign up for our newsletter, we have a pledge there and we'll feature it next month. So join us. And in closing, I just want to say thank you to all for joining us today. We're very grateful to be here and grateful to the FAA for hosting us. And we hope you fly some of our secret sites. And if you do, please let us know. Um, sign up for our newsletter. And you can give us some feedback and tell us what you thought about flying these aerials and get some fun tips on where to go next. Um, so thank pics. you so much. What was that? Send some pics too. Send pictures. Send pic I would love to send this. It's a shame we're not in person because I love chatting and hearing all the stories afterwards. But yes, please send us pics. Well, and we should have some time uh, to feel a few questions if that's okay with, uh, with you, Karen. Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to say, you know, once you're done with all of that, uh, with, with the questions, I have one last uh, comment to make. So uh, I'll just chime in right at the end. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks. Okay, great. Well, um, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, I see there's still a whole lot of you online. If you have some more questions for us, um, please, you know, keep them coming. Um, I, I had a few questions that I wanted to bring up about the NOAA regulated overflight zones. Um, the first is, are NOAA regulated overflight zones, which are the magenta dots that are uh, uh, 1,000 foot requirement, um, only for birds and wildlife, or are there ever any other reasons that they are created? I think they're strictly for wildlife is my understanding. I know that like in the Park Service Grand Canyon, the, there's some areas that were for safety to provide aircraft separation, but I don't think for the NOAA regula re regulated overflight zones, there's any other reason that's been put out there other than disturbing the resources. That, so and that's my understanding, Wendy, if you know differently. Yeah, I think that's right. They're wildlife regulations, so I think they're for exactly that purpose. Yep, that sounds about right. Yeah, and I'll um, just add that many of the NOAA regulated overflight zones um, cover breeding colonies of seabirds and marine mammals. So there are these areas where um, you know birds are um, nest building nests on rocks and trying to raise their young, and um, you know seals and sea lions are are pupping, and they need a little extra protection. Um, another great question that I definitely have not heard before is related to the no regulated overflight zones. There are hang glider areas near many of these sanctuaries. Are the silent hang gliders exempt from the NOAA regulated overflight zones? I, <laughs> I should thinking. know that. I don't, maybe you guys know. I think it's, is it motorized aircraft? I cannot remember off the top of my head. It's a brilliant question. And I don't remember the different regulations, whether it's motorized aircraft or not. Well, that would be in the NOAA regulations. So maybe yeah. that's something we can pick up uh, again later, Matt. Yeah. 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 And then for that matter, um, what about drones? Drones are definitely considered motorized aircraft and they are prohibited from flying in those areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're prohibited because 400 feet and below, and then you can't get above a thousand to fly over them unless you have a permit. So I guess theoretically you can fly above them, but you can't fly in them with a drone. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, what about drones over over parks? I know that's a broad question, but if you could share some expertise. Uh, currently, drones are prohibited from operating from DOI land, Department of Interior, which includes the National Park Service. So. Mm -hmm. And then for like state parks or 
kind of local part? Um, regulations vary state by state and even park by park. So. Okay, um, that's great. Um, and then what about um, one pilot wrote in asking um, if there are any special considerations for flying into Shelter Cove aside from wildlife concerns and um, WX? Wendy, I don't have anything. <laughs> I mean, those are the two, when we thought of, when, when we sort of brainstormed this, we thought of the two main considerations and we had this conversation with Matt and those seemed like the, the most, two most important um, to highlight, but um, I'm sure there's more and, uh, you know, I'm sure you could get in, in touch with some of those tools and um, contacts that Matt listed on his slide to find out some more specific guidance there. Um, Okay, and then um, is there a webcam to see Shelter Cove? Sheila Jessup asks. That one picture was a weather cam at Shelter Cove. I don't that didn't show the airport and that that webcam, but it showed the coast and the and the weather in the town. I don't know if there's a webcam at the airport specifically or not, but mm. yeah, and, there's and that webcam be... in there, Paul. <laughs> uh, no, there is not a surf camera in Shelter Cove, uh, but there is surfing, and um, the the webcam would be a great way to see, you know, how foggy it is there, right? I, I yeah. Fog conditions change really quickly, and um, you know, people love to fly in and hang out for a little while, and and it's uh, and fly out quick before the fog. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, when I, we were flying the islands, I was making the weather call, and I was actually looking at the bald eagle camp at Santa Cruz Island, not looking at the eagle, but looking over the eagle's shoulder, so I could look and see uh, if there was fog up there to make a decision whether we could go or not. So again, it doesn't have to be a weather cam. You can be creative about the online cams that you access to look at the weather up and down the coast. Bird camera is a great idea. There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, great. Well, um, you know, a couple of our um, helpful um, listeners pointed out that wind shear is also a factor for Shelter Cove. And then, of course, the, the fast um, marine layers. Um, um, and then um, why don't we why don't we just have one more? Um, how close can drones fly to an airport? Uh, usually five miles for a controlled airport. So usually within five miles, you start having to need uh, special permission to fly. It kind of steps down. Five miles, you can fly 400, then you get closer, you kind of step down. But the FAA has been pretty good about educating uh, drone operators. Uh, and, and some of the software, actually now, some of the commercial drones will not even allow you to take off within five miles of an airport. They'll actually lock you out. So. Um, they're, they're pretty good around keeping um, drones out of uh, airport airspace. But when you're flying kind of the uncontrolled coast, that's what I'd be more concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I lied. One more. Uh, because this is a topic that fascinates me, and, um, and I love seeing them when I fly into SFO. Uh, John Phelps asks, can you share any insights on the salt ponds in the bay? Oh, is that? Do you have something you want to share, Paul? Or what? No, no, I, I know nothing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm asking. Yeah, I'm asking I'm a little bit about the fall ponds there. Well, one interesting thing there, I think, is that some of them are being restored to um, estuary. So San Francisco, the whole bay used to be an estuary. Um, you know, it still still is an estuary, but a lot of it, a lot of the shoreline has been hardened with you know infrastructure and buildings. And that's one place where they're restoring some, returning some of the salt um, ponds to back to marshes to allow more habitat and allow um, space to accommodate sea level rise. So that's a very interesting um, place with some really neat cutting edge projects going on and fantastic bird watching. That's a real neat place, local place to get, um, get some really interesting birds in there. That's great. Well, um... What a great answer, Wendy, and um, thanks to both of you for being such excellent presenters, and thanks to um, all of our um, listeners that tuned in for this great presentation. There were so many of you, and uh, we're so happy to 
have been in front of you. Um, I know a few folks um, have uh, questions about Wings Credit. Um, we're going to bring Karen Arendt back in from the FAA safety team, and she can tell you all about how to get the Wings Credit. So thank you guys again for uh, tuning in. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you, guys. Um, <clears throat> no, you had a good question on the uh, on the motorized hang glider, and I think that's something that uh, we can bring up later if it affects uh, or uh, UASs. Then it's most likely to affect motorized or any kind of motorized uh, aircraft, mm -hmm. or not just because it doesn't meet the aircraft criteria. It's still bigger even than a drone uh, and as far as the wings credit goes we have uh also everybody that's completed and uh has seen this webinar we offer a wings credit and for anyone who is going to attend the recorded version they can get wings credit also so and that access to that link uh, using the same link that we have offered here uh, will lead you to the recorded version and that stays up indefinitely. So thank you again, guys. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for having us. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Karen. Take care. Take care. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>